right, hallelujah, may you be seated. Thank you, worship team, what a glorious night of worship so far. I know we have more to come. Listen, a quick word for all of you shofar enthusiasts that are here with us tonight, and you might have brought your shofar with you. What we're going to do is we're going to ask you to hold that. Don't blow it until we tell you it's time to blow it. Otherwise, it'll make for a weird sermon. But at the end of the sermon, we are going to have Pastor Derek come back up. We're going to do the traditional blessings, the traditional blasts. And before we get to the final blast of the Tekiya Gedolah, we're going to ask you, if you have your shofar and you want to participate, we're going to ask you at that time to go to the aisles so you don't blow in people's ears. <laughs> You're going to go to the aisles, and then we're going to blow all together the final trumpet blast. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. Now... <clears throat> If you did not bring your shofar, that's okay. Don't feel guilty. It's okay. Feel a little guilty. That's fine. It's Jewish mothers. Um, but you have a role to play as well as if you don't have your shofar, then your job is to shout at the end of the trumpet blast. So either you have the shofar and you blow, or you don't have the shofar and you shout. You need to do something, because if you just sit there, we're going to kick you out. No, that's not what we're going to do. Welcome. King of Kings, so happy to see everybody today. Members, family, welcome back to the house of the Lord. Welcome everybody watching online tonight as well. Kings Community Live, Facebook Live, YouTube, other platforms all around the world. Almost 25 different nations watching already that we know of. Welcome to King of Kings tonight. Uh, and we say to everybody, Chag Sameach. Happy, happy holiday. We have a special group with us tonight. I just want to mention Lake Point Church out of Rockwall, Texas. Thank you guys for being here tonight. I was, just, I was just on your campus a few weeks ago. I got to sit down with Pastor Josh and Pastor Shea, uh, and we, we worked on some plans. Uh, we're so happy that you're with us tonight worshiping on this holiday, but I know you have another group coming for uh, this special event of the King of Kings 40th anniversary celebration, which is happening in November. <gasps> you didn't know about that. I just let the cat out of the bag. That's okay. You'll get it in your email. It'll be on our website. It's two months away. You didn't miss it. I promise. Hallelujah. So we're going to do that. Now notice, I greeted you with Chag Sameach. But you might also hear other greetings this time of year. You might hear Something like L'Shana Tova, Happy New Year, or Shana Tova Metuka, you know, have a sweet New Year, something like that. And all of that's fine, it's good. We embrace it to a point, but one of the things I want you to do tonight is to remember that in the Bible, as we're going to look at in just a second, the Lord set forth seven commanded holidays. And then we can call the Sabbath weekly maybe an eighth holiday, but let's just say seven. And today, or in the last two days, we've celebrated Yom Teruah. It is the feast of the blowing of the trumpet, the trumpet blast. So the, the reason we want to make that distinction is between what the Bible says of Yom Teruah and cultural Rosh Hashanah. Well, they mean two different things. One is the day of the blowing and the trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets, and one is wishing you a Happy New Year. But here's the problem with Happy New Year. It's not the New Year. So that almost doesn't make a lot of sense. As a matter of fact, you're going to hear in a second, the Feast of Trumpets is as far away from the New Year as you can get mathematically. Now, culturally, I know it has different meanings because it's part of a civil new year. It's part of the fiscal new year in, in, a, in a harvest uh, season. I, I know all that. But here's the thing. If you do a little research at uh, when did this idea of Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, that's what it means. When did that come into play in our vernacular here in Israel? It actually, the first identification of that term was in 200 A.D., it came from the Mishnah, which is the oral tradition of the rabbis written down, in 200 AD, which means Yeshua had come and gone, the disciples had come and gone, the apostles early on had come and gone, the New Testament had been fully written, it was finished. All of that was done before the first usage of the word Rosh Hashanah had ever come about. So, 
You ready for this statement? Here it is. You ready for it? Yeshua never celebrated Rosh Hashanah. Now, that doesn't mean you can't celebrate it and have fun culturally, but I don't want us to do that part in exchange for what God commanded us to do. Because celebrating Rosh Hashanah is fine culturally, but there's no promise of a blessing in it. But if you celebrate Yom Teruah and you blow the trumpets in faith of the action, in faith of God's covenant principles, there is a blessing for God's people if we honor his holiday. And so tonight you're going to see us lean into Yom Teruah, not so much lean into Rosh Hashanah. Do you understand the difference between the two? Praise the Lord. Well, let's dive into the scriptures. If you have your Bible, Leviticus 23. Start in verse 23. The other thing we should mention as we start to read is this. Of all of the seven festivals of the Lord, the Feast of Trumpets has the smallest amount of instructions. Which means in God's way of laying things out, it was his way of saying, hey, there is more to come on these instructions. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to look at the what was more to come about the Feast of Trumpet instructions. Leviticus 23, 23. The Lord said to Moshe, he said to Moses, say to the Israelites on the first day of the seventh month, there it is, that's why it's not the head of the year, you are to have a day of Sabbath rest, a sacred assembly commemorated with trumpet blasts, do no regular work, but present a food offering to the Lord. We continue with a corresponding passage in Numbers chapter 29, the first six verses. Numbers 29. On the first day of the seventh month, hold a sacred assembly. That's what we're doing now. This is us obeying the word. And do no regular work. It is a day for you to sound the trumpets, which we also have done and will do. As an aroma pleasing to the Lord, offer a burnt offering of one young bull, one ram, seven male lambs a year old, all without defect. With the bull, offer a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephah of the finest flour mixed with olive oil. And with the ram, two-tenths, and with each of the seven lambs, one-tenth. Include one male goat as a sin offering to make atonement for you. These are in addition to the monthly and daily burnt offerings with their grain offerings and drink offerings as specified. They are food offerings presented to the Lord, a pleasing aroma. Did you notice it is an addition to what you might normally do? Thank you, Pastor Vaco, for giving us a chance tonight to honor the word of God and to receive the blessing straight from scripture. It's in addition to. So if you're a tithing believer, and that should be everyone, by the way, just to let you know our theology on that, Tithing is the 10%. The word in the scripture is measer. It literally means a tenth. So there is no other way to interpret tithe than tenth. You're free to add offerings on top of that, as you might normally do in gratitude of the Lord. And on his special holiday occasions, you're even welcome to bring more other than what you would normally bring. So all of that is in the scriptures. In both of these passages, we see We are called to keep a Sabbath and to sound the trumpets, but we're not told exactly what to sound the trumpets for. So it's pretty easy to say, well, how do you keep a Sabbath? Well, you don't do regular work. You rest, you pray, you worship, you maybe take a nap or sleep late or whatever it is that you do, but it's pretty easy to define what it means to take a Sabbath. It's easy to define what it means to bring an offering, something outside of your tithe, whatever it is. If you want to slip it in a box, you want to slip it in a bag, you want to go online, that's one way. If some of you have goats, just leave your goats in the lobby tonight, that'll be just fine. Those of you that know me know how much I would appreciate the offering of a goat, actually. I have a dream of being a goat farmer, so... If you want to invest into my dream, go ahead. That's, that's great. But it doesn't say much about the blowing of the trumpet and what it's for. So that's God's way of saying, hey, I'm going to reveal more to you later. I've given you an instruction, but I didn't give you all of the details, which means I'm going to give you more later. You say, well, where is that principle in the Bible? Well, do you remember when God called Moses and he said, Moses, go back to talk to Pharaoh 
and I'm going to show you signs and wonders. What, what, what kind of signs and wonders are you talking about, God? Eh, don't worry about that. I will show you those later. Well, is Pharaoh going to listen? No, no, he won't listen. That's okay. I'm going I'm to show you what to do. What, what am I going to do? Uh, that's okay. I'll show you later. Sometimes God gives you an instruction, but he doesn't tell you exactly how or all the details about it. But the rest of the Bible does. If you read the Bible, the Bible will explain the Bible. If you feel like there are gaps in theology, read the entire Bible. It will fill in all of the gaps that you might feel. God doesn't want you to walk around uneducated without wisdom. He is faithful to fill in anything you need from his word. And that's what we're going to do tonight. So if we look at the Bible and we say, what are the examples in the Bible of when we were told to use the shofar? We can start filling in the gaps. And here are a couple of examples. For instance, when Israel wanted or needed to call all of the people together for an assembly, they would blow the trumpet. They would blow the shofar. And it had a particular sound. Now remember, no cell phones, no computers, no news, no internet, no texting. So if you wanted people to get together, you had to somehow let them know it was time to get together. So they would blow the trumpet. And the shofar call was a specific call to that instruction. So when Israel needed to come together to assemble, they had a call to assemble. That's what Pastor Derek did tonight. We, he blew the trumpet. We assembled. We also see a call to worship. When it was time to worship, they would have a different sound, and it wasn't confusing between the two because the two sounds were very different. That's why Pastor Derek went through several different sounds for you to awaken your ears and your spirit to the different sounds of the shofar. One would be to assemble. One would be to worship. One would be a call to war. When the enemy was attacking, they didn't have time for people to run out or ride horses and tell the rest of the tribes, hey, we are being attacked, we're at war. They didn't have time for that. So the fastest way to alert the whole country was to blow the war sound. And on every mountaintop and on every high place was another watchman that had a shofar and he was trained to repeat the sound that he heard. And within minutes, the whole country was able to hear a symbol, worship, or war. Isn't that amazing how God did that? There's a lot of meaning here. There's a lot of prophetic symbolism. The trumpet was also used to announce God's holidays because we didn't always have calendars. We didn't always have watches. The sundial was a little unreliable depending on where you were. But when you heard the priest blow the special sound for the holidays, and it was repeated from mountaintop to mountaintop, within minutes, the rest of the country knew it's now time to start the Sabbath or to start the holiday. It would announce the new moons, the changing of the months. It would even announce the year of Jubilee. Now, this one touched me this week when we were in study because Pastor Derek gave the message at Nachalat Yeshua Tenu on Thursday night when we were welcoming Yom Teruah. And he said a phrase that really grabbed me. And he said, can you imagine being enslaved? Can you be, imagine being so far in debt you had no hope and you could not wait for the 50th year Jubilee to get there? You knew it was coming close, but you weren't sure exactly when it was going to arrive. And finally, you heard the trumpet blast all over Israel that set you free. It was the year of Jubilee trumpet blast. So we're not making this up. All of this is found in the Bible. These are the unfolding revelations of God about why to blow the trumpets and what it could mean in its various sounds. But we also learn from the scriptures that the shofar blast was used any time the king had left his kingdom and had returned. It was telling the country the king is back home. You understand? Today, there's monarchies around the world that if the king or queen is at court, what do they do? They fly the flag so everybody can see that they're at residence, right? Those of you that know your, your monarchy history. 
But in ancient Israel, when the king would return, they would blow the trumpet, letting everyone know the king is home. Oh, now you can see a lot of prophetic meaning, can't you? God calling his people to himself. God calling his people to worship. God calling his people to make war. God letting you know what time it was. Sabbath, new moon, new month, holiday, jubilee. And God letting you know, hey, I'm back. The king has returned. All of this is easily seen in the Bible itself. And as we turn to the new covenant, we're gonna add a few pieces to this. Turn in your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That'll be the main text tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I first, I'm gonna read from verse 51 and 52. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash at the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Notice which trumpet it was. It's all of the other ones have led up to this one, and this one becomes the last one. But something extraordinary happens on this one because the dead in the Messiah are raised at this trumpet blast, and then we are changed. And then it uses the word imperishable because it's referring to the body that we have. The body you have right now is not the body you were supposed to have. Can I get an amen? amen. I see some of you are like, I don't know, I like it. It's pretty good. <laughs> Others of you are like, I can't wait to get rid of this one. I heard that amen, thank you. But it uses the word imperishable because it's saying at that last trumpet blast, not only is the king returning and the dead being raised, but you were promised a body and now you get to have it. The one you were supposed to have in the garden that you never got to have because of what we did collectively in sin. Now in this passage of 1 Corinthians 15, before we get to the section about, hey, the dead are raised and you get your new body, because that was verse 51, right? That's a lot of verses before verse 51. So you might say, Pastor Chad, what's going on before that? Well, the Apostle Paul is making a very important theological point. What he's saying is this. It is important that we as Messiah followers believe that he first was raised from the dead then we can believe that we will be raised from the dead. But if you don't believe that he was raised from the dead, you'll never believe that you will be raised from the dead. As a matter of fact, it's summarized in same chapter, verse 17. And if Messiah has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. You see, the Bible says that if we don't believe that Yeshua was raised first, then we have no hope and we are to be pitied more than all people because this whole believing life is a sham. It is a trick. It is a lie. Because if he didn't rise first, then we will never rise. Now you understand why it's so important that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Yeshua is the Messiah and he was raised from the dead. Because it's not until you say that and you believe that do you get to participate in this last trumpet's raised from the dead, receive your new body? You must believe that he was the Messiah and that he was raised from the dead to connect with your inheritance of resurrection. Now watch this. We're going to go a little bit further. Let's learn a little bit more about that last trumpet, that final moment. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Yeshua those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. 
For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead and the Messiah will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left, we will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So we're adding layers. We're adding information. We're adding meaning to the sounding of the trumpet. Now we have a loud command from heaven. The Lord himself is there. Apparently, it's an archangel who is there, and we hear the trumpet blast. Then you got to understand that at that moment, there's two kinds of humans. There are humans that are still alive, that have never died, and there are humans that are believers, and they have died already. But of the two who gets priority in that moment are the dead. The trumpet blows and the dead come back first because we believed in the resurrection, so we get the inheritance of the resurrection. Then those who are still alive get caught up with the Lord in the air, so there's a priority here. Let me give you a key phrase for tonight. And this this is something the Lord just hammered home with me over and over this week in study. Here's your key phrase of the night. The holiday of first fruits, back in the spring, the holiday of first fruits focuses on Yeshua's resurrection. But Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, focuses on our resurrection, the resurrection of the believers. So now you have in your tool belt the understanding that there are actually two holidays that focus on resurrection. The first fruits, his resurrection. Feast of Trumpets, our resurrection. That's how important this day is. Now you can see why I'm pushing us so hard into Feast of Trumpets and a little bit less into New Year. Believing in the New Year doesn't do anything for me. But believing in the resurrection does a lot for me. And that's why I don't want it to get watered down. I don't want it to become weak, so culturally mixed that somehow we we lose the inheritance the Lord has given us. Now, you see in these passages that the return of the Lord is predicted with a trumpet blast. Our resurrection is predicted. Our physical body is being changed to the imperishable. And you might say to yourself, Pastor Chad, I'm buying in. I love it. I want to be part of it. When is it going to happen? Let me know. Well, if you get our newsletter, no, no, that's not, that doesn't, that's not how this works. Listen, last week, We taught that the Lord is perfect. Everything he says, thinks, does, reacts to, creates, commands, prophesies, has been perfect his entire existence, however long that is. But he's not only perfect, as we determined last week, he not only creates perfectly, but do you know the Lord has perfect timing? And that's the sermon title tonight, if you want to go back and share this with somebody from our archives. The Perfection Series, tonight's sermon title, Perfect Timing, Feast of Trumpets. Now I'm sure that all of us would love to know exactly when will this last trumpet sound? When will all of these great things take place? But you know what? We're not given all of the details about that. Sound familiar? Kind of like Feast of Trumpets. Go blow the trumpet, what for? I'll tell you later. I'm coming back soon. When will that be? I'll tell you later. I'll fill in the details. But again, we're not left without some structure around it. It's just that we may not know the exact moment. And I love to say this. I just think this is funny and why I want to encourage us to never try to predict the day of the Lord's return. We can say we're getting close, but don't try to predict it. Why? Because every person in human history that's ever tried to predict the day of the Lord's return has been wrong. (laughs) Right? So you follow me. So if you don't want to join that list, stop trying to predict it. I don't want to see a book come out. I don't want to see numbers. I don't want to hear about the Mayans and their calendar. I, you know, just hold off. The Lord will do it however the Lord would like to do it. Let's look at this verse here. 1 Thessalonians 5, 
1 through 3. Now, brothers and sisters, about the times and the dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. So even if you try to predict it, the timing of the Lord's return, you're going to be wrong, and it's going to come like a thief in the night when you did not predict it. Yeshua went on to share a parable about his return because he was getting lots of questions, and that's fair. That's a human natural inclination is to say, oh, when? So it's not wrong to feel. Just don't try to predict it. But Yeshua gave a parable, and at the end of his parable, speaking about when all of this would happen, he said, Matthew 25, 13, therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. So that means you can know the season, You can know that we're getting close, but you won't know the exact time. And just in case that some of us might be getting impatient, who is honest with me tonight would raise your hand and say, I'm a little impatient. I need the Lord to come back right now. Good, good. Sometimes I feel like that. My wife is here tonight, and I think that's one of her favorite things to say, actually. Man, I, if he would just come back. You know what I mean? It's like going through a hard day if he would just hurry. But here's the, the solace for you tonight from the book of Peter, chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You might say, what is taking him so long? Because the Lord's plan is to be patient so that the largest number of saved people can come into his family. And only he knows that moment when that final soul, when that last number, that last crop and harvest comes in so that the number is its highest number, then he'll return. But he won't return until that happens. It's not out of slowness. It's not out of him being confused. You got to understand, guys, they're not up in heaven having a, a conference right now trying to figure this out. But it did make me wonder on a human level, and sometimes I have these weird thoughts when I'm reading the Bible. I like to share them with you because maybe you have some strange thoughts when you're reading the Bible. But normally when I share these weird thoughts with you, I step out from behind the pulpit. So I'm clearly off to the side. I said to myself this week, the Lord said it's going to happen. We know it's going to happen. And now we kind of fret and we want to know exactly when it's going to happen. And sometimes we kind of push the Lord, when are you going to do this? But I wondered in my mind if that had ever happened in in created history before. Like, was there this moment of Genesis 1, 26, let us create man in our image? And then was there a time gap from that statement to the actual creation? Because if there was, you know that somebody in heaven was asking, are we doing that today? No, not today. Oh, okay. Tomorrow? No, not tomorrow. Okay. Will you let me know when we're going to do that? Yes, we will we'll blow a trumpet or something. We will let you know when it's time. You'll hear the Lord's voice. Or when Adam and Eve sinned and God had to come down into the garden and make the first sacrifice, never forget that, he made the first sacrifice for our sins. He rescued us when we knew nothing of what to do. We sinned, but we didn't know what to do about it. He said, I will rescue you. I will come and show you what to do. He made the first sacrifice. But from that moment on, you understand that he was proclaiming that one day I will come and fix all of this. I will come. God will come. My own right arm will come. You know how many times in heaven they probably ask, is that today? You know what I'm saying? Watching from the window of heaven being like, oh, oof. God, I'm, I mean, I'm watching the creation down there. They are really messing it up. Is today the day? Not today? Okay. Next week? No? Soon? Because they are really about to destroy themselves. But at just the right moment, when it was the perfect time, Yeshua came. God himself came to rescue and to become that sacrifice. Why? Because God is perfect in timing. He's not scared. 
He's not scared about how wicked the world is becoming, and it is certainly becoming wicked, so we can know the seasons. He's not slow. He's waiting for the most souls possible because he's patient. The fall festivals of the Lord symbolize a series of culmination events in human history. We know that at the end of the age, we'll hear the trumpet blast, the return of the Lord. He sets in his earthly kingdom for a thousand years. The dead and Messiah are raised, new bodies. The ones alive are met with him in the air. All of this is going on. He's establishing his kingdom. But then we also know that the next holiday of Yom Kippur which we'll celebrate next Sunday together, brings in judgment. So the, the shofar tells you the king has returned. And it sets off a 10-day period that we call the days of awe, where we are supposed to repent for 10 days, leading up to the final judgment, which is exampled by Yom Kippur, which is followed by Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, when we finally dwell in our finality in the peace and presence of the Lord in his heavenly places. And the, the festivals of the Lord lay all of this out for human history. It's not that hard to grasp and to see what it all means in its order. But something is holding the Lord back. He is perfect in timing, but he does say something is holding him, him back. He, we may not know yet what that is, but the Bible does speak about it. Let me give you our last two passages of tonight. Revelation chapter 10. Verse six and seven, Revelation 10, six and seven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, he said, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, that's the last trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets, so there's a mystery that's still to be revealed. Now, I think we've got a glimpse of the mystery, but there could be more that we learn. That seventh trumpet, that last one is gonna blast, announcing the return of the king and our resurrection. We add some details in the next chapter, Revelation 11, 11. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on the thrones before God, they fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant again. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a severe hail storm. Boy, that's a lot going on when the trumpet sounds. It's not just, doo -doo. well, that was nice. All the universe changes at the trumpet blast. And that's what we're supposed to be looking forward to. That's what we're supposed to be remembering. That's what we're supposed to be preparing for. We see the end of the age and the opening of another age at the trumpet blast. We notice that the Lord begins his reign at that trumpet blast. We notice that the time of judgment begins, pointing to the Day of Atonement, which I'm going to focus on next Sunday. We notice that the time for rewarding the saints of God also happens at the trumpet blast. That's good news. That's something to look forward to. So many things. We're resurrected from the dead. We're given our our new bodies imperishable, and we start to get our rewards, and the Lord has returned. What a glorious time. You can see why the Lord said, hey, you want to focus on this holiday. I also noticed that God's temple in heaven was opened. Perhaps this is the one that Moses saw when he 
saw the, the blueprints of what to build on earth. Maybe that was the temple that Yeshua did the final sacrifice at. More on that next week. That's where we're going to start next week. I noticed that the Ark of the Covenant is around. So if anybody thinks it was lost, that's just a movie. God knows where it is because it's right there in his temple. We're going to see it again. We're also going to see the tree of life, by the way. If the Lord has all of these minute details already in place, waiting to happen, and everything is choreographed perfectly with the trumpets and the archangel, the return of the Lord on the clouds, our new bodies are ready, heavenly places are ready, the new Jerusalem is ready, the temple is opened, the Ark of the Covenant is polished, it's ready. And if he's got all of those details down to the moment, don't you understand that the Lord has perfect timing on his return? Do not be afraid of what you see in the world around you. It's going to get worse. But the more darkness rises, the brighter our light becomes. The more the power of darkness is seen, the stronger the power of the Holy Spirit in us can be seen as well. The more evil you see, the more miracles you'll see. It's going to be a glorious time leading up to this final trumpet blast. But keep your hearts focused. Don't let the ways of the world pull you. It's fine to celebrate some cultural stuff. It's fine to celebrate some national things. It's great. But not at the expense of God's appointed times. Because He has given you a covenant promise in those days. I'm going to invite Pastor Derek to come up and join me. And we're going to read a, a few traditional blessings over the trumpet blast. Thank you, Pastor James. From Leviticus 23. Debea el Bene Israel Lemo, Bechodesh Hashvi, Beachad de Chodesh, Yelechem, Shabaton Zikaron, Terua, Mikra, Kodosh. Call מלכת עבודה לא תעשו, והיא קרבתם אשה לאדוני. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, it is the first day of the month, it shall be a Shabbat of rest unto you, a memorial proclaimed with the blowing of the shofar, a holy convocation. You shall do no regular work, and you shall bring an offering of fire to the Lord. Tikub chodesh shofar, that was from Psalm 81. Sound the shofar on the new moon at the appointed time on the day of your feast, for this is a statute for Israel and ordinance by the God of Jacob. Psalm 98. With trumpets and the sound of the shofar shout joyfully before the king, the Lord. Baruch at Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu Bidracha Vitzivanu Lishmoa Kol Shofar Amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your word and commanded us to hear the Shofar call. Baruch at Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shechianu Vekiyamanu Vehegianu Lazman Azeh Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us life, sustained us, and brought us to this season. Blessed are the people who know the sound of the shofar. In the light of your manifest presence, O Lord, they shall walk. Hayoshev al kisei ram venisa, the king who is seated on a throne, he is high and lifted up. Amen. Why don't you stand with me as we obey these commandments? And I want you to receive this blessing. What we're going to do is, if you have your shofar, go ahead and go to the aisle. We don't want any injuries tonight. Go to the aisle. 
And what Pastor Derek is gonna do is I'm gonna lead him in the shofar call. We're gonna do the, some of the traditional calls in order, three rounds, and you don't blow during that. That's not your blow. When we get to something at the end called the tekiah gedola, that's where we all blow together, one long breath as long as you can hold it. And if you don't have a shofar, this is your part, you must shout, hallelujah, the king is coming. Right? Do you understand what you're shouting? What are you shouting? The king is coming. That's right. Lord, hear our cry today. We remember your words. Tekiah. Shavarim. Teruah. Tekiah. Shavarim. Tarua Tekia Shavarim Tarua Everyone together Tekia Gedola Hallelujah The King is coming Hallelujah The King is coming Hallelujah Praise the Lord, hallelujah.